So we've, we've moved, I, if you paid attention to the email, I, I've flip-flopped the evening and the morning service, the sermon, because really we're starting 2 John, and in 2 John, today's message is a little bit like kind of an introductory type of a message, maybe a little more like a Bible study. So I moved that to tonight, and I moved tonight to today to give you a little bit of a taste, just a little bit of a taste of the type of thing we do on Sunday night. All right, so now those, those of you who come on Sunday nights, you kind of know what's up. And uh, I think uh, in, in, in some ways, Sunday night is, uh, I don't know, I don't want to say better, but more valuable even in some ways. I mean, we spend a lot of time in the Old Testament studying what we see, what we see God doing in history. And uh, right now, we're working through First Kings, and we're working through the life of Elijah, and to kind of get you ca- caught up with where we are, it hasn't rained in three and a half years. Now, we wake up and there's rain, and you know, anyone ever go, what's the longest you've ever gone without rain? A couple of weeks or so, months maybe, I don't know. What's that? Several weeks, several weeks. As I mentioned, uh, as, a, as, as a baseball guy, you get out on that field, if it doesn't rain for a few weeks, and it's concrete. It's a piece of concrete, and those balls go bouncing all over the place, and it gets hard, and for stuff to grow after a few weeks is pretty difficult. Well, in Israel, it's six months. Six months is their dry season, and when I was over there in 2014, I was over there in uh, September of 2014, and the rains, the sky opened up. And there was clouds, there was clouds. I was like, wow, I haven't seen clouds in a while. And there was rain for like 30 seconds. And they were like, you just got a treat. You just got rain in September. And I was like, oh, that's pretty cool. You know, I'm glad it doesn't rain anymore because I don't want to be, I have enough rain where I live. But uh, three and a half years, three and a half years without rain. And so now in Israel, and just to kind of show you what, what's going on here, where we are in the, in the timeline, we're, we're in the reign of Ahab, who rules from 874 to 853 B.C. So this is almost a thousand years before Christ. There are no crops in the land of Israel. Food is running out. Death abounds. The kingdom of Israel, the northern kingdom of Israel is in shambles, and this is what happens when you forsake the Lord. Now, I, I, I kind of showed you this, and I, I forgot some of you haven't seen this before, and the, the left side is the, king, the kingdom of Israel up in the north because the kingdom divides around 930 or so BC after the reign of Solomon. The kingdom of Israel divides into two nations. There's the kingdom of Israel in the north, and that starts with Jeroboam and has many dynasties. And then there's the kingdom of Judah in the south, which is the, the dynasty of David. Okay. Well, well, we're dealing with the north, with the northern kingdom of Israel. And Ahab is a terrible, terrible king. Anyone remember uh, who? Anyone re- remember who his wife is? Jezebel. She good or bad? I mean, you should know just on the name. That's not, you know, I, t- today people, they'll name their kid Jezebel. I'm like, what are you thinking? Read your Bible. Sorry if, if, if you're one of them, but let's face the facts. If you did it, you probably did it ignorant of what God said in the Bible. You probably wouldn't have named your kid Jezebel, you know, or, or, uh, or Delilah. That's not, a, that's not a good one. That's not a good one in the Bible. It's not. But Jezebel's evil. Ahab is evil. He is a terrible king. He's worse. The Bible says he's worse than any king up until that point. You are the very worst king up until your days. And I've joked and said, you are the very worst president of the United... I mean, king, you know, up until your days. There have been some bad ones in the past. Few didn't know where they were going or where they were. But that's another story for another day. Ahab and Jezebel have led together, they've led Israel down a path to utter darkness, worshiping Baal, the storm god, the fertility god, who rides on the clouds as his 
here, who rides on the clouds as his chariots and, and wields a lightning rod as his weapon and worshiping Asherah, the female goddess of fertility. That's what Baal, that's what Ahab and Jezebel are leading Israel toward. This false, idolatrous worship. But what we know is that the Lord is the true God. He is the living God. And he's brought this drought upon Israel, this three and a half year drought, as a form of punishment. It's, it's not only punishment against Ahab and Jezebel, these evil rulers, but it's, it's punishment against their so-called gods. Because Baal's the provider. Baal's the one who brings the rains. And so if the storm god can't bring the storms, that's, that's a little bit of a, of a judgment, a visible judgment for the people to show this god is false. God has had enough of their foolishness. And now it's time to show all Israel that the Lord, he is God. Now, Elijah, Elijah the prophet. Anyone remember what Eliyahu, Eliyahu means? Elijah, anyone remember what that means? Anyone remember what Eli means? El, what's El mean? God, Eli means My God, right? So Eli Manning had a great name. You know, Eli was the man. But uh, anyway, as a Giants fan, I would like Eli Manning. Eli Yahoo. Eli Yahoo. Yahoo is the Lord, Yahweh. The Lord is my God. Elijah, the prophet of the Lord, has been in hiding for three and a half years. And that's because he's a wanted man. He's the most wanted man on earth. If, 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 if Ahab and Jezebel have a, a top 10 most wanted man alive, Elijah's the top of it. And when he finally shows himself to the king of Israel, the king of Israel sees Elijah and says to him, and this is just a quick review of how last week ended, says to him, is this you you troubler of Israel. Ahab is so evil. And Jezebel is so evil. By the way, Ahab, Ahab is, a, is a, children, a child of Israel. He's an Israelite marrying an unbeliever, right, from Phoenicia who worships false gods. And of course, he adopts her false gods, just like Solomon did when he married all these unbelievers. Ahab is so evil that he can't even judge right and wrong. He's so evil that he thinks that the prophet of the Lord, the one who's really evangelistically trying to get them to repent and turn away from their false gods and turn toward the Lord, he, he thinks, he's so evil that he thinks Elijah is a troubler of Israel. That's how evil he is. In actuality, he's the troubler of Israel, and that's what Elijah says in verse 18. He said, I have not troubled Israel, but you and your father's house have. You are the troubler of Israel. You have forsaken the commandments of the Lord, and you have followed the Baals. You are the troubler of Israel. And it's time for a showdown. That's where we left off last week. It's time for the showdown. Look what, look what Elijah says in verse 19. Now then, you troubler of Israel, now then, send and gather to me all Israel at Mount Carmel. Not Mount Caramel. By the way, caramel is caramel. It's not Carmel. If you order a hot caramel sundae with nuts, for, well, you, you can't have nuts now at McDonald's because a few people are allergic to them. That means no one can have them. Um, we understand that, right? So you can never have dairy products anymore. You can never have any of those things. And for some reason, you know, it's a hot caramel sun. It's not a hot caramel Sunday. Okay, it's a hot caramel Sunday. Just so you know. If you ever hear me say caramel, I like apples dipped in caramel. I'm making fun of people who say it that way, just so you know. I won't tell you I'm making fun of it because I, I want you to be able to like cleverly understand the, the humor, but never, never look. So now, now then, send and gather to me all Israel at Mount Carmel together with 450 prophets of Baal, Baal, and 400 prophets of the Asherah who eat at Jezebel's table. And so it's a showdown between 
the prophets of Baal and himself. Elijah is calling for 800 prophets, 450 prophets of Baal, 400 prophets of Asherah, to come against him, the single prophet of the Lord who's there. And so it looks like 850 v. 1. Those aren't good odds for Fortnite, are they? <laughs> what, how many people start in Fortnite? 100? And it's, it, you know, I don't know. It's not 850 versus 1. It's 1 v. 1. It's 1 versus 1. It's the Lord against Baal here. Who is the real God? And so the contest is between, like today we're going to have many contests, many football contests, right? The Giants are going to play the Jets. The Eagles are going to play somebody, I'm not sure who, and other people are going to play other people. The contest is the Lord against Baal. The playing field is Mount Carmel. Now, Mount Carmel uh, is 1,700 feet above the Mediterranean Sea. And from parts of the mountain, you could look out and you could see the Mediterranean Sea. From other parts of the mountain, you could look out and see the Jezreel Valley. So this is kind of like, I, I circled the area. Um, you can kind of see right here is the Jezreel Valley. You could see Jezreel here. You might have heard of the Valley of Megiddo or Armageddon or something like that. Well, that, that's, that's, that's based on this, this valley where a lot of battles would take place, right? Jezreel, you can't read this, but Jezreel is, is right here. And the capital city of Samaria is down outside of the valley. But if you were to go up northwest up the valley of Jezreel or the, the, the valley of Megiddo or the valley of Armageddon, and, and towards the, the northwestern section, there would be between the valley and the Mediterranean Sea, Mount Carmel. 1,700 feet away. Well, again, if you, look, if you look out towards the sea, you'd see the Mediterranean Sea. If you look toward the east, you would see the Jezreel Valley or the Valley of Armageddon, right? Here on Mount Carmel, and I took this picture. I was here. It was, it was, a, glorious, it was a glorious spot, except the Roman Catholic Church ruined it. Or somebody ruined it. They put a, they put a, they put a little... What do you call that? Like a chapel there with an idol of Elijah there and, and a stone slab. And it just kind of, nah. I don't really care about that. I care about the site itself, not the, not the later erections of worship sites. But anyway, you look, you look down here and, and, and you'll see the Valley of Jezreel. But here on Mount Carmel, Baal is worshipped. Here on Mount Carmel, Asherah is worshipped. Here on Mount Carmel, which we'll see later in the passage, the altar of the Lord, because what they would do in the ancient world is they would, they would go up to high places because they felt closer to the gods, and they would build these sites of worship. So they have a site of worship for Baal. They have a site of worship for Asherah. But here on Mount Carmel, the altar of the Lord is run down. It's in disrepair. And so this is an active worship site for Baal, but not for the Lord. Really, kind of like a home game, if you're looking at a home game for, for the Baal worshipers, all right, in a way, a game for, for the Lord. And so Elijah proposes a showdown, and Ahab, the worshiper of Baal, he he likes, he likes the showdown. He likes the, the terms of it in verse 20. Uh, so Ahab sent a message among all the sons of Israel and brought the prophets together at Mount Carmel. Now, now this showdown probably happens on kind of a flat space on the mountain. I, I envision a couple of different spots. Nope. Here we go. I envision a couple of different spots. It, it could be in an area, something like this, or even, even down lower on on the mountain where you could gather, you know, somewhere around 500 some people or so, right? It's got to be somewhere where you could gather. Here's a little, a little uh, vineyard, olive grove, whatever. An area like this where they might have gathered together or an area lower on the mountain where they would have gathered together for the showdown between the Lord and Baal. But I see this kind of as an opportunity for Ahab. I mean, in, in my mind, the way, I, the way I imagine Ahab seeing it is that this is an opportunity for Ahab to finally kill his man. He's been wanting to kill this guy for three and a half years. And when Elijah fails, 
this is a perfect opportunity being surrounded by worshipers of Baal to just go ahead and kill Elijah. Maybe even in a frenzy. Maybe just kill him and be done. But let's be entertained first. Let's see what he has to, let's, let's watch his antics first. That's how, I, that's how I imagine the account. But I also imagine a lot of other things here. Like I imagine the news spreads. You try to imagine it, right? The news spreads that there's going to be a contest between the gods, right, in the local area, in the area surrounding Mount Carmel. And so people show up at the worship site uh, waiting for the participants. Uh, the 450 prophets of Baal show up, right? Group of Baal prophets come in, more Baal prophets come. Baal prophets galore, 450 Baal prophets. I don't know how many, how many people will fit at a, say, at an East Stroudsburg High School football game. Anyone know, like, rough idea on that number? Someone says a thousand, you think about a thousand? So figure the home side, all right? So figure most of the home side, full of Baal prophets, showing up on a mountain, right? The home crowd of a high school football game. I haven't been to a high school football game in a long time. Um, but anyway, so the home crowd of a high school football game coming in and gathering together, and these guys are prophets of Baal, 450 prophets of Baal. They see these prophets of Baal arriving. They see the king arriving with pomp, right, and circumstance, I imagine, chariots and horsemen. And then all this stuff's going on, all this noise, all this chatter, and then comes... One dude, one guy, one strange looking guy on the other side of this thing. I just, this is just how I imagine it. I, mean, I don't know if that's exactly how it worked out, but that's how I imagine it. This is the guy who prophesied that it wouldn't rain. This is the guy who brought all the trouble. Oh, man. Oh. Something big's about to happen. I want to be there to see it. Well, after a while... Elijah quiets the crowd. Look at verse 21. Elijah, Eliyahu, the Lord is my God. Yahweh is my God. Eliyahu came near to all the people and said, how long will you, he quiets the crowd down. How long will you hesitate between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, follow him. And he hears crickets. <laughs> I wish I had a sound of crickets. Can someone play a sound of crickets on their phone real quick? Crickets. All right. You should be ready for this. You should. No. <laughs> not yet. The moment's passed. The people did not answer him a word. Not a word. Elijah calls these people out for their idolatry. You know what they want? They have two opinions. They have two opinions. They really do. They have two opinions. So they want to worship the Lord, and they want to worship Baal. That's called religious syncretism. They want to worship the Lord, and they want to worship Baal, the storm god. And they sometimes go back and forth between these gods. And based on inscriptions that we found, not we, not me, that's an exclusive, that's me, them and not me, <laughs> that's archaeologists. Based on inscriptions that have been found and, uh, and other writings, we see the Lord and his Asherah. And so we see that they took the worship of the Lord and they took the worship of Asherah and they put them together and they made Asherah at times in their idolatry, they made Asherah the Lord's wife, just like they did with Baal. So it was syncretistic worship. These guys worshipped more than one god. And they would sometimes vacillate, go back and forth between these gods. And so Elijah tells them to choose their god and follow him. And it's not much unlike what Joshua said over 500 years earlier. Before they entered the land of Canaan. Before they entered the promised land. Then he says, if it is disagreeable in your sight to serve the Lord. Choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve. 
whether the gods which your father served, which were beyond the river, or the gods of the Amorites, in whose land you, are, you dwell, you are living. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. You can serve whomever you want. We're going to serve the Lord. And Elijah's making a similar, a similar call. Not much unlike what Jesus would say about 900 years after Mount Carmel, when Jesus says during the Sermon on the Mount, one of the most famous sermons ever preached in the history of mankind, and he says, no one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or, either he, will, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. These people, they want the Lord and Baal. And that's not unlike a lot of people today. It's not unlike a lot of people today. People worship the Lord and they love the world. They love the world. And they'll put all types of things above the Lord and they'll put all th types of things above worship. And that happens every single Sunday when some of the people of God are worshiping while others are doing something else. And we could, we could apply that in many different ways. People should have been reading their Bible on, on, you know, every day. You should read your Bible every day. But instead, they watched a movie or looked at something they shouldn't have looked at or whatever. Anyway, Elijah sets up the stipulations. He calls for a decision, and then he sets up the stipulations of the contest in verses 22 through 25. Elijah, then Elijah said to the people in verse 22, I alone am left a prophet of the Lord. Now, do, is that necessarily true? I mean, it might feel like that for him right now. And he is alone there. He's the only one there. He's the only one who's willing to be out in public dealing. So that, that's probably what he's referring to. But we know that there are how many? At least how many? at least right now, right now, that we know of, there's a hundred prophets of the Lord that are in a cave. And we know soon, soon enough, we know there are more people that have not bowed the knee to Baal. But for now, we know that there are at least a hundred prophets of the Lord that this guy, which guy? What's his name? This guy took them by 50s and hid them in a cave from Jezebel. The man's name is? Obadiah. Obadiah. See, you got to come this Sunday night. you got to come. You would know this stuff. Anyway, <laughs> see, every once in a while, you got to shame people. Shame is, you know, every once in a while. I try not to, uh, shame's not my, the name of my, my primary game, but, you know, I like to throw, I like to sprinkle it in a little bit here and there for fun. You know, for fun. Then Elijah, then Elijah said to the people, I alone am left of a prophet of the Lord. I'm the only one here, but Baal prophets are 450 men. It's 450 V1. At least that's what it looks like. Now, let them give us two oxen. Give me an oxen. Give the 450 prophets of Baal an oxen. And let them choose one ox for themselves and cut it up. They're going to pick the one. They're going to they're choose first. So, so, so the odds are... This is not magic. The odds are stacked against me, 450 V1. You pick the oxen. They're going to pick the oxen and cut it up and place it on the wood, but put no fire under it. And I will prepare the other ox, the one, the leftover one, and lay it on the wood, and I will not put a fire under it. Then, verse 24, then you call on the name of your God, and I will call on the name of the Lord, and the God who answers by fire, he is God. And all the people said, that is a good idea. Right? <laughs> I like it. I like that idea. So Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, choose one ox for yourself and prepare it first for you are many and call on the name of your God, but put no fire under it. And so we have the, uh, 
we have the stipulations here, right? We have these two oxen, we have the prophets of Baal choosing first, and the God who answers by fire is the one true God. He is the God. And the other one isn't. And this test, this contest, will, is, is designed to unequivocally prove, without a doubt, who is the God and who isn't. Well, again, the people hear it and they like it. And so the prophets of Baal are up first. That's kind of like if you're comparing it to a football game, it's kind of like winning the coin toss, right? So they win the coin toss, all right? And they call upon Baal to bring fire from heaven in verse 26. Then they took the ox which was given them and they prepared it and called on the name of Baal from morning until noon saying, oh, Baal, answer us. <laughs> That's how when I listen to my Bible, that's a, oh, Baal, answer us. <laughs> kind of makes them sound like a, like a bunch of nimrods. Oh, Baal, answer us. But there was no voice. No one answered. And they leaped about the altar which they made. So they start in the morning and they go until noon. So this is going on for hours and hours and hours. Sounds like a Pentecostal worship service, leaping about and jumping about and making a big fuss, right? Yet there's no voice, no one answers. <laughs> Sorry, but it's true. The time of the morning offering was often understood to be somewhere around nine o'clock. And here you're seeing somewhere around noon, so I think it's fair to, fair to surmise or to guess or to estimate that this is about three hours. So for about three hours, oh, Baal, answer us. But there was no voice. Why? Psalm 115.4, their idols are silver and gold, the works of, men's, of man's hands. They have mouths, but they cannot speak. They have eyes, but they cannot see. They have ears, but they cannot hear. They have noses, but they cannot smell. They have hands, but they cannot feel. They have feet, but they cannot walk. They cannot make a sound with their throat. Like Jeremiah would say, Jeremiah 10. Like a scarecrow in a cucumber field are they, and they cannot speak. They must be carried because they cannot walk. Do not fear them, for they can do no harm, nor can they do any good. Jeremiah says that hundreds of years later. And so they leaped about the altar which they made. They're jumping around and making fanciful prayers to Baal and going and blowing people down on the ground. <laughs> you know, they have, a, they have a full on Benny Hinn service going on right now. And nothing happens because it's not real. No God answers. Their charismatic worship, and I mean charismatic as in charisma, means nothing when it's based on lack of truth. And so Elijah, witnessing their utter foolishness, begins to taunt them. Look at verse 27. It came about at noon, after hours and hours and hours of witnessing this, that Elijah mocked them and said, call out with a loud voice, for he is a god. Either he is occupied or gone aside or is on a journey or perhaps he is asleep and needs to be awakened. <laughs> this is getting good. Elijah's mocking them, taunting them. And they deserve it, by the way. They deserve it. Do they deserve it? Oh, they deserve it. Well, when the prophets of Baal hear this, they get stirred up. They get stirred up into a frenzy. So, verse 28, they cried out with a loud voice and and cut themselves according to their custom with swords and lances until the blood 
gushed out on them. They mutilate themselves, hoping to wake up their sleeping God. And this goes on for three more hours. It reminds me of, uh, I was overhearing the, the children's history lesson today, this week about the Quakers. It reminds me of the, the Quakers worship service where they'd all sit around and wait for hours and hours and hours until somebody would finally hear a message from the Lord. By the way, the Quakers, a, a group of the Quakers would also be called the Shakers because they'd tremble and convulse. It was basically pre-charismatic worship, pre-Pentecostal worship. But anyway, the Quakers would sit around for hours and hours until somebody would get a message from God. Well, I can imagine Jim Billy Bob sitting there and being like, man, four and a half hours. I'm just going to do it. I have a message from God. You know, let's get this over with. I'm hungry. <laughs> right? I could be wrong, but something like that, I imagine. Hours and hours go by. Like six hours. Will bear respond? Will he send fire? Look at verse 29. When midday was passed, they raved until the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice, which is said to be something like 3 p.m. or so. So if the morning, the morning offering is like 9 and the evening offering is 3, and we don't know for sure that that's the timing of this thing, but if that's the case, we're talking six hours. You think this service is long. We're going to be done usually around 12.15, and we usually start around 11.05. That's like an hour and 10. That's not terrible. That's not bad. Not terrible. Six hours. We could do six. You want to do six hours? And I, it might be a show. I'll, I'll start jumping around and dancing, and I'll, you know, bring a motorcycle in and do wheelies. Oh, wait, they already did that. <laughs> Pentecostals already did that. Sorry. There was... Oh, sorry, when midday was passed, they raved until the time of the evening, the offering of the evening sacrifice, but there was no voice. No one answered. No one paid attention. One guy says, leaping around this altar may have provided an entertaining show, but it accomplished nothing spiritually. Because Baal is nothing. Baal is not here. Baal is not real. So after about six hours of the prophets uselessly calling upon the name of their false god, it's Elijah's turn. Verse 30. Then Elijah said to all the people, Come near to me. So all the people came near to him, and he repaired the altar of the Lord, which had been torn down. Well, doesn't that tell you something? What does that show you? When the altar of the Lord is torn down. Now, just to give you a kind of a feel, I took this, I think I took this picture. I'm not sure if I took it or not, to be honest with you. This one might be better than the one I took. This is a picture taken at Megiddo. And you remember I said the valley of Megiddo, and down in the, across the valley is the town of Megiddo, and you could look out and you could see the whole valley of Armageddon, and a valley of Jezreel, whatever you want to call it. Well, right in the middle of this little section of uh, this archaeological dig, you, you'll see this round structure. Right here, see this? This round structure is an altar, right? It's an altar of stones where a priest would go up the steps and burn an offering to a god or a false god or whatever, right? So it might be something, something like this, maybe a smaller version of this, right? I mean, I don't imagine Elijah's going to go and build something like that and and, you know, in a short period of time. So, so a smaller version of this. But anyway, you, so Elijah repairs the altar of stones, which has been long run down, which tells us all that the people aren't worshiping the Lord here. They've forsaken him. 
They've allowed his altar to be destroyed. And so Elijah repairs the broken down altar and he prepares the offering in verses 31 through 35. Elijah took 12 stones according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob to whom the word of the Lord had come saying, Israel shall be your name. So with the stones, he built an altar in the name of the Lord. And he made a trench around the altar, large enough to hold two measures of seed, large, large trench. Then he arranged the wood and cut the ox in pieces and laid it on the wood. And so everything up to this point kind of makes sense, right? Okay, we're going to lay out our offering. And then he says, fill four pitchers with water and pour it on the burnt offering and on the wood. Well, that's interesting because it hasn't rained in three and a half years. And so the stream bed that's at the, 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 the bottom the foot of Mount Carmel uh, is beginning to dry up. And this this contest is important enough to be able to use much needed water, or perhaps, perhaps, maybe they took water from the Mediterranean, which wouldn't be far away either. We don't know. Fill four pitchers with water and pour it on the burnt offering and on the wood. Now, anyone here ever make a, we have a few people here who could build a fire, right? Mr. Mr. Nivelt here, you can build a, a Daniel and build a fire. My daughter is doing a pretty nice job. Who, who here can build a fire? For those of you who can build a fire, if I, you took the wood there and I just took, a, took a, a garden hose and I just sprayed all the wood down, real good. Is that, is that good or bad for, for a fire? Depends on what? If you have scout water. I don't even know what that is, but what's that? Oh, white fuel, okay, okay. Probably not. The answer is probably not. That's the answer. No, it's not good. It's not good to, to dump water all over the wood and, and the ox that you're trying to burn up. Right? Fill four pitchers with water and pour it on the burnt offering and on the wood. And he said, do it a second time. So they take four more pitchers and they, and they dump it on there. And he said, do it a third time. So they take four more pitchers and they, they dump it on, on the whole thing, which basically makes it pretty much humanly impossible, given the technology that they have in that day, pretty much makes it humanly impossible to really burn anything. The water flowed around the altar and also filled the trench with water. So there's so much water that the trench gets filled. There's no way in the world that you can burn this offering under these wet conditions. I can only imagine what the people of Israel are thinking. Like, what in the name of Sam Hill is going on here, right? Like, what is this? He's out of his gourd. He's completely lost his mind. Or something like that. That's that's what I would would think. Wouldn't you think that? I would think that. Unless they have, what'd you call it? Huh? White fuel. You know how I do a fire? I, I just sit there and pour uh, lighter, uh, lighter fluid. I squirt the lighter fluid all over it, and, and then it burns that off, and I squirt more and squirt more, and it never starts. I can't start a fire. I didn't start the fire. But then, having saturated the offering with water, Elijah prays to the Lord in verses 36 and 37. Check this out. At the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice, Elijah the prophet came near and said, O Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, today let it be known that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant and I have done all these things at your word. Answer me, O Lord, answer me, that this people may know that you, O Lord, are God and that you have turned their heart back again. This is the moment. This is the moment they've been waiting for. What will happen? Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt offering and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. 
Fire comes down from heaven and consumes everything. And the Lord clearly displays that He is the one true God. It's a majestic show of His greatness, it's a majestic display of His power. And the people see it and they get, I mean, how could you miss the point here? How could you miss this one? Even the water gets licked up by the fire. Is the term like you have? You have uh, uh, is that is that called an anthropomorphism when uh, you attribute a human characteristic to fire that the fire like has a tongue and and laps up the the water like like my dog who licks up the the water out of a bowl, right? Disgusting animal he is. And the people see this wondrous, amazing act of God, and they get it. Verse 39, when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and they said, the Lord, He is God. The Lord, He is God. The people realized that Baal is nothing. He is not the storm God. The Lord is the God. He is the true rider of the clouds. He is the one who really wields the lightning as His weapon. He is the one who brings the rains and the drought. He is the only true God. And if that's true, and it is, and it's been clearly displayed that that's true, then that makes the 450 prophets of Baal what? Who said? Liars. that's That's not what I had, but yes, liars. Everyone else had what I had, which is false prophets. And in an Old Testament mosaic economy where false prophets would take people and lead them away from the Lord, resulting in their damnation, resulting in their death, resulting in the judgment of God, what did they do in an Old Testament mosaic economy to false prophets? They put them to death. That's what they did in that economy. Look at verse, in that administration, and that management of uh, human affairs. Look at verse 40, the way God was managing an Old Testament economy. Then Elijah said to them, seize the prophets of Baal. Do not let one of them escape. So they seized them. And Elijah brought them down to the brook Kishon and slew them there, struck them there. These false prophets have been leading Israel astray long enough. They, along with Ahab and Jezebel, are the true troublers of Israel. They, along with Ahab and Jezebel, are the reason for the drought. And they, along with Ahab and Jezebel, are the reason for God's judgment upon all the people of Israel. And so Elijah and the people take them down to the brook at the base of Mount Carmel and bring down the judgment of death. And they do it to turn the people, to save the people from turning away from the Lord. What a glorious display of God's power and authority. The people thought that Baal was the God of fertility, the storm God, all of that. They were wrong. It's clear that the Lord is the God. And Baal is a figment of their imagination. A demon. He's a demon. Asherah is a demon. By the way, so, is, so are all the false gods today. Demons. And now, it becomes very clear who the true troublers of Israel are. Ahab, Jezebel, Baal, Asherah. And it becomes very clear who the real deliverer of Israel is, and that is the Lord. As I've been saying, Baal is impotent. And the Lord is omnipotent. He is all-powerful. Baal has no power. The Lord is all-powerful. Baal is dead. And the Lord is a living God. Baal is nothing. And the Lord is everything. The Lord is good and he is worthy to be praised. This passage makes it abundantly clear that the Lord is the living God and he demands exclusive worship. He will not share his worship with another. A lot of people reject that truth today. They reject the truth that God is the, that the Lord is the only true God. A lot of other people claim to believe that, but they put all other all types of other things ahead of the Lord, things like money and accolades or um, prestige, popularity, self-worth, luxuries, cars houses, 
vacations, work, relationships, all types of things. And when you put things above the Lord, you are making an idol of that thing. You better watch out. Because the Lord will not share his glory with another. The Lord is a living God. And he demands exclusive worship. But he also will stop at nothing to save people from destruction. Sending fire from heaven to prove that he is the one true God during the reign of Ahab. Doing something much greater than that over 800 years later when he sent his son to live, die, be buried, and raise again on the third day so that you can have everlasting life. God will stop at nothing to save people from destruction, even, even sacrificing his own son to die on the cross to pay the penalty for your sins. I'd like to ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes for a brief moment of invitation, just you, me, and God. Uh, no one looking around. You're here today, and you're not sure you're saved. I'm not sure I'm going to heaven when I die, but I'd like to be sure. Would you just raise your hand up for me? I'd like to, to pray for you. I'm not sure I'm, I'm saved. I'm not sure I'm, I'm a real Christian. Anyone in this room, I'm not sure I'm going to heaven when I die. But I'd like to be sure. You're in this room, and you know you're saved, but God has been convicting you about some stuff. Maybe, maybe there's some things in your life that you just, they, they found their way above God. Maybe it wasn't anything that was intentional, but just these things crept in and just little by little just, just took first place. God has convicted you about that today. You want to repent about that today. There's some, there's some stuff in my life that, I see that. There's some stuff in my life that, uh, that God, is, God is convicting me about that have slowly crept in and, and taken too much importance when they should have no importance. I see that. Some sin in my life that I need to, I need to repent of today, maybe. Anyone else? Heavenly Father, we praise you and thank you for this awesome display of your glory and majesty. We know that you are the one true God. And oh, how glorious it would have been to be there and to see uh, this, this awesome, most famous passage of scripture. But now, almost 3,000 years later, we can read about this text because you have kept it, you have preserved it. And we can know that you are the only true God and that you demand exclusive worship. Pray for anyone in this room who isn't saved. I pray that you would bring conviction upon them until they turn and repent and be saved. I pray for these others uh, who have felt the convicting work of your Holy Spirit for whatever it is that they're dealing with. I pray that, you, were, that you, would, you would encourage them, that you would strengthen them, that you would move them, that you would help them to have victory, that you would remove obstacles as only you can do, that you would draw them more near to you than they've ever been. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, we're going to change the song. Uh, I'm going to go with uh, 389. 389.